with me in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And this morning we believe in the great hope. How many of you are excited for the great hope? Amen. Oh my. How many of you are excited for the great hope? Amen. Okay, okay, I'll, I might stay on this side. We'll have to see. That great hope. The fact that, that one day, how, how many of you have ever, remember, remember he hall Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Yeah. If it weren't for bad, like I'd have no luck at all. Whoa, gloom, despair, and agony on me. How many of you know that sometimes becomes the mantra for the children of God? I don't believe that's God's will at all for our lives. He wants us to have hope. These three things, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. A powerful portion of that is faith. But how many of you know, mentioning those three things is a powerful word and a powerful way of life, and that is a life of hope and fulfillment. And God wants us to, to know beyond any shadow of God. How many of you know, if God said it, it's settled. Amen. God said it, whether I believe it or not, it is settled. That's the end of it. And God has told us about his great hope. And we're going to take a look at that and the importance of, of us being hopeful. Because we know the world, those that don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they can... They can pray to any other God, they can serve any other idol, they can, they can do wonderful things, but how many of you know, if they don't know Jesus Christ and hold Him as their Lord and Savior, if they aren't serving Him, they are hopeless. They have no hope. And today we're living in a world, in a nation, in a county, that I believe is filled with hopeless people, and what better time to bring hope to a lost and dying world, what better time for them to be receptive to that hope than during the Christmas season. And this morning, we're going to take a look, and by the way, I would encourage each one of you to make sure you stay away from the term holiday. Mm. Fourth of July is a holiday. Memorial Day. And Labor Day, they're holidays. Even Thanksgiving, I'll give you, is a holiday. Christmas is a holy day. And Christmas, what is it, Ray? It's Christmas. Christmas is a holy time, a time of remembering Jesus Christ was born. I mean, stop and think about that fact. You, you, think, you, you think if you got a million dollars, you'd have a good lifestyle? I think I can try. <laughs> yes, yeah. ready to be pulling out the guns. Who's coming after me? But this morning, I want you to know that no matter how much money, no matter how much what you've got, it doesn't compare to what Jesus Christ had in heaven before He came to earth. He left. He left the throne. He left. The, the constant presence of the angels. He left the brightness of the glory. He left, even though God is omnipresent, his relationship with him, part of that relationship, he had to leave. Jesus, he came and he was fully God and fully man, yet he chose not to be omnipresent. He was one place at one time. He left those things so that he could be born in a situation where his mother was unmarried. He would be born homeless, living in a cow stall, laid in a trough. He was born with a king looking for him so that he could kill him. And then when the king couldn't find him, he killed all the baby boys. He had to run and his family had to carry him into exile. And even when they came back, 
there was a concern. He left heaven in all the glory of that so that he could come and live among us, his children, his creation, who had failed so miserably. And if that wasn't enough, then after teaching us what it is to really live for him and to live for God, he surrendered his life, allowed his body to be beaten beyond recognition, to be nailed to a cross, and then to die and be placed into a grave. Then he, as he's in that grave, he's there in the grasp of death for three days. But he conquered death, hell, and the grave so that we could know that heaven that he left behind. So that we could know the glory of being in the presence of the Father. He left all of that so that we could have hope. And this morning, I want us to grasp the importance of the hope that we have the to grasp, if it wasn't important, Jesus would not have done what he did. But he did it so that we could have a hope that goes beyond the grave. And this morning, I want us to recognize that we have hope today. I want you to take a hold of hope like you've never taken a hold of it before. I want it to change your Christmas. Yeah. I want it to change the Christmas of those you come into contact with. But I want it to change your life. That hope will change your life, and your hope will change the lives of others. How many of you believe that this morning? Amen. Amen. So let's take a look at that hope in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Paul here, writing, starts out by saying, We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. How many of you like being informed? We're living in a, they call it the information age. If you want to know what's going on, you turn on the radio, you turn on the telephone, you, or television. Yeah, you can do it on your phone now, can't you? Mm -hmm. Your telephone, your, your computer, your tablet, whatever you've got, you can get information like that. You want to find out what's going on around the world, you just put in enough search criteria and it'll take you there and show you what it is. But how many of you know, as we live in an information age, there are a lot of people that are uninformed. As a matter of fact, there is so much information. How would you like the responsibility of being, being in charge of a 24-hour news network and you had to keep news constantly in front of people? How much news can there be? Well, then we'll go out and make some of it up. <laughs> That's what they do. <laughs> We'll make our own news. There's so much information coming out. And how many of you know, not every bit of information that comes out is accurate. Uh -huh. <coughs> Just because, I, I, would, I was going to say Dan Rather, but I don't think he's around anymore, is he? Peter Jennings, is he around? I don't watch the, the network news much anymore. Brian Williams, he's one I'm missing. So just because they say it doesn't mean it's true. But if it's in the word of God, it is true. And when Paul says here, but we do not want you to be uninformed, he's given you some important information here. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For we, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. You talk about hope. We will always be with the Lord. I, I, when I teach this, I call it the boom boom theory. The trumpet's going to sound, and boom, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. When they get to the level that we're at, I believe, boom, we're going to rise with them. That's what the scripture says. 
And so I'm, I've told people, I, I hope I have the presence of mind to do the Superman. <laughs> Especially if I'm in the basement of a skyscraper. <laughs> It'd be quite the trip. But as we consider that fact, then, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. He is, that is not the second coming of Christ. The second coming is when he comes and touches the earth, and that is going to be the battle of Armageddon, or the end of the battle of Armageddon. The first coming was in that manger. Second coming is the battle of Armageddon. In between there, he's going to be in the sky. And we're going to rise to meet him there. That's what the scripture says right here. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so that we shall always be with the Lord. Having that information in your hearts, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Father, today, I pray that these words are a comfort Lord, for those over the past year that have lost loved ones, I thank you, Father, that those that died in Christ, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and they are with you, and one day the trumpet's going to sound and that old dead body that it wasn't glorified yet is going to be glorified as it comes forth and is joined together with the Spirit in your presence. Lord, I thank you that we can, we can lift one another up with these words. But Father, for too many of us, we have doubts and fears. We're not sure that those that we love, those that we, that we are friends with, those that, that we live in the neighborhoods with, those that we commute near and with, have that great hope. Father, I pray that you will help us today to take hold of that hope because we are informed and bring that information to the uninformed that we would all have the hope of Christ Jesus. Lord, that we would start this Christmas season with an attitude of worship, with a powerful praise coming forth from us for your glory, that will cause others to recognize that they need Jesus Christ. They need that hope that goes beyond the grave. Lord, open our thought process today and help us to receive from you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, there are several things that we can learn from this passage of Scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But... First, I want us to take a look at, and most of I want us to take a look at, that this, this passage of Scripture, these verses that we just read, they divide everyone in the world into two groups. There are two kinds of people. Now, I know if you take some kind of sensitivity training, they tell us that everyone is the same, everyone is alike, but I'm here today to tell you that not everyone is the same. Honey. Look at the people next to you. <laughs> They're all different. But the greatest difference, the most important difference in the kingdom of God is this fact of those that have hope and those that don't. That's what it comes down to. If we have a hope in Jesus Christ, if we have the hope in Jesus Christ, we're in that group that is hope. Full. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Full. Did they say it like they meant it? <laughs> oh. I am hopeful. If you're hopeful, then you're full of? Oh, oh we're getting it this morning. And if we're hopeless, we're missing? Oh. Okay, now we're getting it. We're starting to get there. We are hopeful. If we have Jesus Christ in our life, if, listen to me, how many of you remember the old Gaither song, I'm making a list of won't be's in heaven? You remember that one? I don't even think I got the melody right. Uh, I, remember, I remember writing down the road and that song came, there won't be, you know, bills coming. How many of you say glory? Uh, there won't be cars that are breaking down. You know, I don't know, I'm making these up. I don't remember the words. But I remember as we're driving along, my dad's driving, 
And I'm in the car and they're singing along. And they said, now you make it up. And they say, there won't be. And then the music just plays. And I, was, I said, school. <laughs> there won't be tests. Woo there won't be teachers. And I said, wait a minute. <laughs> there might be a few teachers there, yeah. But the fact is, those things that, that we can make a list of things that won't be in heaven. There won't be heartache. There, there won't be disgust. Mm. There won't be Satan. <clears throat> there won't be sin. There, there won't be terrorists. Ooh, ooh, here's one that'll get you. There won't be tax men. <clears throat> Oh, glory, I felt that too. Hallelujah. All the things, so many things there will be, and there will be. We need to make sure we're not just on the negative. We need to be on the positive. There will be the glory of God. There will be everything that the depths of my heart desires. There's going to be, oh, there's going to be music like you've never heard before. There is going to be worship. There's going to be glory. I mean, up there, they use gold for pavement. The walls built of jasper and rubies and emeralds. Oh, oh, just, and, and God's glory in the midst of all that lighting it all up. Disney World's got nothing on heaven. We've got that great hope that as we serve him, that one day we will, it'll be worth it all. Amen? Amen. Those, and, and we, if we have Jesus Christ, if you're here today, and you aren't ready, should the trumpet sound, and you aren't ready, or you walk out those doors, and your life ends, if you're not ready, you need to get ready. You need to have this hope. It will change your life. But if you have this hope, but it's not stirring within you, if you have this hope, but the cares of this life have begun dampening that hope and dimming that hope and pushing it into a corner of your life, Listen to me this morning. God wants you to have hope. He wants you to be alive and be excited about the life that's coming. Those with hope live their life. They live a life of hope. Wherever they go, they take hope with them. By the way, if you got up this morning, how many of you got up this morning and got dressed? Thank you so much. <laughs> And you're welcome. I got dressed too. And we put on our clothing and we get all ready and we, we comb our hair and we head out and, and hit the road and we go about our day. And so often we have different things that we wear for different days of the week. How many of you, maybe for work, you have to wear something a little different? Maybe you got to wear a uniform. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you work some place where you're in a freezer all day, so you got to, in the summertime, you've got to wear a coat or something. You know, you may, maybe you've got to wear a helmet. Or maybe you've got to, whatever you're wearing, you put it on for that day. And then the next day when you're doing something different, you dress for that. But how many of you know, that's not the way God wants us to dress for this world. He wants us to put on his glory every day. He wants us to put on that hope every day. And he wants us to take it with us because we, uh, the people that have hope, live that life of hope. He says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. People who have no hope are uninformed. That's what the scripture just told us. If they have no hope, they are not properly informed. People with hope are well informed and they live a life that demonstrate, demonstrates hope so that the hopeless seek that needed information. <clears throat> That's what ministry is all about. That we live a life 
Your ministry, maybe you teach a Sunday school class, or maybe you counsel people, or maybe you maybe you uh, pick people up for church, or or you know, all there are so many ministries that you can be involved in. But the fact is, everyone has a ministry, a ministry of hope. And that hope has to flow out from us. And people that are uninformed need to know that, that there is something to live for. And we, in the body of Christ, need to know that, that God wants, he's, he said that he is laying aside, he's, he's putting aside rewards for each one of us. He's, he says, build up in heaven rewards that will last forever. Those of gold, silver, precious stones. Don't lay out rewards that will burn, that will rot, that will fall apart, that will fade away. And part of our great hope is that one day we will get to enjoy that reward. You know, stop and think about it. We... Most of us go to work every day. And we are working for that reward of a check that they put in our hands or they direct deposit for us. And a lot of us hopefully have, have retirement plans where as they're paying us, they're also putting into this retirement account. And one day, that and what is the golden age anymore? Do they have a golden age in retirement? 105. 105 is that <laughs> planning ahead. You know, we look forward to that retirement, that what we've what we've laid aside so that we can live on that and we don't have to work. We can be like Bud and golf every year. Every chance we can. Retirement's fun, isn't it, Bud? There you go. He's earned it. He's worked for it. Anyone that's retired that's worked for it and has, has planned ahead, I mean, they're just, they're living that, that dream. But God has a retirement for us that goes beyond anything that we can plan here. And we need to build up those treasures, those rewards in heaven that will not pass away. I don't know about you, but I want to live a life that glorifies God so that for eternity I'm not wishing I'd have done more. And as we live for him, it causes that hope to grow because we're not invested in this world as much as we're invested in the kingdom. As we look at this, we need to know that people watch us and they're looking for that hope within us. A scripture that I try to share anytime I have a, a funeral where I believe that there, there might be a group of folks here that aren't saved. And uh, lately, I've had, I've had a unique opportunity to minister, uh, build a relationship with a fellow at one of the funeral homes here. And when they have someone come in and they say, we don't have a pastor, we don't know a pastor, he calls me up and says, are you available? And if I am, I tell, sure, I'll come over and, and I'll take care of that for you. Because I figure if they don't even know a preacher, there's a good possibility that they don't know anything about the Lord and their, their hearts are not ready for, for his return. And so I look at that as a great opportunity to, even in a time of funeral, to pour hope into them. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, it talks about the fact that they desire hope. And this is what I share with them. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their hearts. Oh, people know that they're going to live forever. They may say, no, when you're dead, you're dead, and it's over with. But inside, every one of them, whether they want to admit it or not, each one of them knows deep down inside that they're, they're designed to live forever. He has also set eternity in their hearts. Yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. He has also said eternity in their hearts is what he said. And he said that that goes on and, and it works in them. And as, as we who love Jesus Christ and know about heaven and expect to be there, we've got that joy that comes forth from us. And they need to see that joy. They need to see that investment in the kingdom of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14 again says, For if we believe that Jesus died 
and he rose again. Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Those that have died that know Christ, we have that hope that one day, and I tell you what, there's nothing more difficult as a pastor than to preach a sermon at a funeral and have a pretty good idea that the person that's in that casket or in that room never had a relationship with Jesus Christ. And to try and put hope that God has given me a hope that I've got to share with them. I've got to tell them that there is more to life. And, and the fact not only of, of that hope that goes beyond the grave of eternity in heaven, but that hope of being a family. How many of you enjoy being part of your family? You just had Thanksgiving. Any of you want to throw back? <laughs> oh, few hands like, oh, yep, that's me. But to be a part of a family. Sometimes I don't think we appreciate our family until we don't have them. But God wants us to know that, that we have that privilege of being grafted in. Romans chapter 8, verse 16 tells us about that hope of being a family. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. When you're struggling, the Holy Spirit is speaking to your spirit and saying, it's okay, no, you're a child of the King. We have that hope fixed within us. It goes on in verse 17. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, we are heirs of the Father, and we are joint heirs with Jesus. I don't get that. I tell you what. That just, that I am a, a co-heir with Jesus Christ just blows me away. But that's what the word says. If children heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. God wants us to know that our hope needs to go beyond the pain of this life. The struggles of this life. And this may be a hard one to grab a hold of, but if we truly pay attention to it, it says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. How many of you have found some of the most painful times of your life? A few years after it's over, you look back and you realize God was taking me through it and it wasn't nearly as bad as it could have been. That, that struggle that, that hurt so bad now as I look back at it, I learned a little bit from it. I was strengthened through it. And God had me all the way. He says, for I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed for us. Now listen to this. This is the, hope is incredibly powerful. Verse 19, for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. The earth is anxiously waiting for the trumpet to sound and for those that have hope to be revealed. The earth and all that God has created is anxiously waiting for this next step to take place. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly. How many of you know this was a much better place before Adam and Eve sinned? It was a much better place to live. I don't think they had boys and Ivy back there. How many scratchers can say amen? <laughs> All I got to do is see a picture of it and I start getting it. It's terrible. I remember when I was a kid thinking, Adam and Eve, I'd just like to get my hands on you. Oh, the thorn bushes didn't have thorns, they were just beautiful. The weeds weren't there to take over. Crops grew. Everything was beautiful. <coughs> Skeeters didn't bite. Whew. And creation was as God designed it to be. And then a curse was placed on this creation because of sin. And now, for creation has, was subjected to futility. That sin that changed everything. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free. And creation, even creation has that hope, knowing that it will be set free. If a little rock knows 
that is going to be set free from the bondage of sin, how much more should we recognize that we've got a great hope? For it's slavery to corrupt corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. You know, we've seen, there, there have been some things happen in the last few years that I have never seen before. We are seeing... They're calling it climate change. I'm calling it God getting ready to end everything. Yeah. We're, we're seeing volcanoes erupting. All of a sudden, they're talking like it's record-breaking pace. Earthquakes. We, we saw record-breaking storms go across the countryside. And just, I don't know, how many feet was it? Seven feet of snow? I cannot fathom. What do you do with all that? And all of these things are taking place, and I believe, believe you're just beginning to see things that we've never seen before. As the earth is, it says, the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. I'm not even going to begin to know what childbirth is about. You ladies can <laughs> but I, I, I know the, the ladies that, and I don't, I'm not down on anybody that takes medication for childbirth, but there was a point in time I believe they pretty much just kind of knocked you out and got the baby and went on. I remember when Tish was giving birth to Rachel, and she said, I don't want any, any drugs. I said, that's cool, no problem. She was, after 23 hours of labor, and her about breaking my thumb, I remember she held on to my thumb. I, I, I prayed, Lord, if I start crying, I'm going to look terrible because of the pain she's in. I'm just going to say, oh, my thumb. You know? But it got to a point where the pain was so severe, I looked at her and I said, don't you want to take a little bit of drugs? She said, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> cool. And that's where the earth is at right now. The earth is at the point of that childbirth, that that freedom, that great hope, and the earth is beginning to churn and know that the glory of God is getting ready to be revealed. You talk about it when Jesus rose from the dead. The earth, I mean, it was, it was busting forth. Things were going on because the earth knew that it was the beginning of the end. When Jesus broke forth and claimed victory, the earth itself responded. Those graves were breaking open. Things were happening like they had never seen before. And you talk about something big happening. Jesus rising from the dead was huge. But that was one man rising from the dead. When the trumpet sounds, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And the, I don't know, the Bible doesn't say we sing the graves will burst open. It doesn't say that. It just says they're going to rise. And we imagine it's going to break forth. But can you imagine the mayhem that's going to take place on this earth as airline pilots disappear? Cars, all these cars with cruise control, nobody thought about that. Gone. And the cars are still going down the highways. You talk about mayhem. Elementary schools being just emptied like that of all the children. The parents looking for their children. The older children coming home and finding mom and dad gone. You talk about mayhem. And the earth is recognizing that even before we are. And the fact that, that that's the beginning. As the trumpet sounds and, and the glory of God is revealed as those who have called on the name of the Lord, those who are living for that hope are taken up to be with him in the air. The earth is groaning. Verse 23, and not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, and that should be taking place, that we are groaning within ourselves. One of the things that we groan within ourselves about should be those that are lost and dying all around us that aren't ready, and the trumpet could sound before I finish this sentence. 
their lostness. We should be groaning within ourselves for them, but also we should be groaning within ourselves, longing for that great reward to be with our Heavenly Father, to see Jesus. Can you imagine looking into his eyes and hearing him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been so faithful over so many things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you charge of a bunch of stuff. Come here, let me give you a hug. And then you might our hearts should be longing to be in the presence of God. Paul explains our need to appreciate that great hope in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 5, that you be so sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. You talk about someone that has hope within them. The King James, I, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the King James, but I like it for some things. I, New American Standard Bible, I like it for most things. And NIV, I like it for some things. But in, in the New American Standard, he says, I have fought the good fight. But in the King James, it says, I have fought a good fight. That makes it more personal for me. Everybody's fighting the good fight. But the fight that God has given me, the, a, a good fight that he's given me. And Paul had that hope within him. That hope that there's laid up a, a, a reward for all that he's been through. You talk about a guy that's been through it. I don't have it here in my notes, but he, he starts giving his credentials at one point where they're, they're kind of denying him his apostleship. And he starts talking about, I've been shipwrecked. I've, I've been stoned. I've been left for dead. I've been held prisoner. I, all these, I've been beaten. I've been uh, left for dead for that. All these different things. And still Paul has that great hope within him. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. I have hope. He says, in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge will award to me on that day. You talk about hope. That's what he's living for. On that day, there's a crown that God has prepared for me. He's, he's made that crown and it's been prepared with all the jewels that are supposed to go in it. And every time I accomplish something that he has planned for me to do, every time I've glorified him, every time I've served him, every time I've ministered to others, he has put another jewel in that crown. And one day he's going to take that crown. And I want to make sure it is full of jewels. And he's going to put it on my head so that everyone can see. And so that I can then take it off and lay it at the feet of Jesus. We'll bow down and lay our crowns there before him. And I don't know about you, but I don't want no snaggle tooth crown that should have had jewels in it that aren't there to lay in his feet. Sometimes I get a, I don't know what to do. I, I, I would not make a good poker player. Somebody lays something in front of me that I don't understand. You can tell by the look on my face. I mean, thank you. I don't know how Jesus is going to go about doing it, but I imagine there's going to be a lot of people laying crowns and pulling their, lighting their eyes and not wanting to see the expression of Jesus. They, and, but if we, if we would live in such a way that we would, would be able to, to place a crown of value before the Lord, that would make us all the more look forward to that great hope, that eternity with Him. He will award it to us on that day. But he goes on and says, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. For those who look for him, that's who you for. But to receive that great hope, we must take a look at Titus chapter 2, verse 11. It says, For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desire and 
to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from the very lawless, from every lawless deed, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Some of the reason the body of Christ doesn't have that blessed hope is because we're allowing sin to have dominion in our life. And that sin, as it's covered here, it may be denying, uh, not denying ungodliness. God has instructed us to stay away from ungodliness. It may be because we're desiring worldly things. But when we, I think this is pretty basic, live sensibly. That's what Titus 2.12 says, to live sensibly. Righteously and godly in this present age. And sometimes we just get numb. I experienced that. I think we all have a numbness in our lives. I remember when I, my first trip to El Salvador, We were there for a week. No running water. They had a little boy that threw water up from the well and filled up a big, big tub. <laughs> you didn't drink it. They, they had bottled, bottled, big bottles of water for us. But to shower, you'd take a bucket and dip it in and then you'd go into the shower area. You pour water on yourself, then you soap up, and you pour water on yourself, and you get out. <laughs> kind of had to do the same thing for the restrooms. They didn't have running water, so you had to take a bucket of water and flush the toilet. By the way, they didn't have seats. You learned to squat good. <laughs> In the house we stayed at, they had a computer, but it only worked when the electric was running and wasn't brown out. Had no TV, no radio. And we were there for a week. We lived among the people. And in just one week's time, I came home, somebody asked, what do you miss the most? And I said, well, my wife and kids, yeah, okay. What, what material thing do you miss the most? And I sat down and I thought, ice water and my recliner. And I remember I got home and I got a big glass filled with ice and water. I sat it down on the table next to my recliner. I kicked back. And at that time, you know, at that time we didn't even have a remote. Turned on, had the TV on, and I sat back and looked at that TV, and I was embarrassed by what I saw. And then I started thinking. I saw that two weeks ago and didn't think twice about it. Being gone from it, coming back, I, I realized that I had grown numb to some things. And in this present age, we can become numb to so many things. And God isn't interested in this present age as far as how it determines our life. He's interested in his holiness and his righteousness. He's interested in godliness. This morning, that may be why the church has lost its zeal for hope. The question this morning is, are you ready and are you waiting for the trumpet to sound 
Are you living in anticipation that Jesus Christ will return? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 50 says, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. And as Paul wrote that, he believed that the trumpet was going to sound very soon. And I can tell you today, I grew up in the church hearing people say, Jesus Christ can come back at any second. And after a while of hearing it over and over again, you get to a point where you think, yeah, I've heard that before. And then we lose hope. But I want you to know today that it's going to happen. And some of us, I believe as I read these words, we will not all sleep. There are people under the sound of my voice that are going to be alive in the trumpet's house. And I believe that there are more than you recognize because it's coming quickly. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable, must put on the imperishable. And this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, listen to this. If you have hope, therefore, my beloved, beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. This morning, as we close out part of this series on what we believe and we take a look at it, we believe in the great hope that the trumpet is getting ready to sound. The dead in Christ are going to rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Why? To meet the Lord in the air. There's a song I used to Love to sing. I never sang it for people. I just loved singing it. And I remember in Georgetown, the, the church we were in, it was over 100 years old. And the basement, it was an echo chamber that I, when nobody was there, I liked to go down there and just sing. And there's a song that was written about that time. It says, I heard about the day you went away. You said you went to go prepare a place. And even though I've, I've never really seen your face, Lord, I'm missing you. I'm missing you. So I lie awake tonight and I watch the sky and I wish it didn't have to be so high because I belong on the other side because I'm missing you, Lord. Because somewhere beyond those stars, is someone who belongs to me. You know, I know I've made a place for you here in my heart. Lord, I'm looking forward to the place you've made for me there. That's what our hope is all about. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places, many rooms. If it were not so, Jesus said, I would have told you. He is the epitome of truth. In my Father's house are many rooms, many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I'm going to prepare that place for you, you know that I'm going to come again and I'm going to receive you unto myself so that where I am, that's where you'll be. He wants to be with us so desperately that he died so that we could be with him. How desperate are we to be with him? Are we willing to die to self? We have a of living forever with Him. This morning, I want us to take a hold of that hope. That hope that the world so desperately desires to see. That hope that goes beyond the grave. I want us to take a hold of that hope, and I want us to live it with every fiber of our being. Because this morning, God doesn't want you to be an informed. He wants you to know that there is hope that goes beyond the grave so that you can take that information and you can live it out loud to the world around you that is uninformed. This Christmas season, the greatest gift that you have to give I'd like to ask everyone to stand with me. And I want this, I believe God is a jealous God. And He wants our complete attention. Nothing else is important right now except hearing from him. Nothing else will last for eternity. this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, I pray that we, in return, have been faithful to you. Lord, I, I ask in Jesus' name, that you have begun and will continue to kindle that fire fresh and anew. That fire that's driven by hope. Hope. Lord, I pray that when, when our love is look us in the eye, they see. It inspires them. Lord, I pray that as we go through this Christmas season, that people will see in a dark and dreary world the power of hope coming from us. Father, in the next few weeks, people are going to be searching for hope so desperately that some of them are going to be driven to suicide. Some of them are going to be launched into a depression that's going to change their lives, or at least alter it severely for several months. And what they need is real hope. I pray that we will 
give that gift of hope everywhere we go and to everyone we speak with. Lord, that hope of the great, incredible resurrection day blessing of hope in each and every life. The stress the hurt the disappointment the confusion the lack Father I pray that it will be gone in Jesus name and I speak hope in its place a hope that wells up from the very core of our being. Father, I speak the blessing of pouring that hope into a hopeless world. Father, I pray that it would be possible that we would turn Licking County into a place of hope this Christmas season. Not a hope for a short period of time, for weeks or months, but a hope that lasts for eternity. And Father, I speak the blessing of allowing your hope to flow through us that we will accomplish for you and we will lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust will not corrupt. Father, I pray the blessing upon each one of us that we will work for you as hope rises up within us, as faith takes its place, and as love pours out that we will see lives changed for eternity and we will see crowns filled with jewels. Lord, that's my prayer as the shepherd of this flock to see a church filled with people seeking you, Father, and the power of your spirit through Jesus Christ so that I as pastor and somehow present each person complete in Jesus Christ. That's my prayer, Father. And I speak that blessing into this church. And I count it as done. In Jesus' name. And everyone that received that said, Amen. Amen. Amen.